Mr. President, Secretary General. For the first time since the United Nations was born, there is a full-fledged war in the center of Europe. Everyone in this hall and everyone in the world knows that Russia, and Russia alone, started this invasion now facilitated by Belarus. This war was not provoked. It was chosen by someone who is right now sitting in the bunker. We know what happened with the person who sat in the bunker in Berlin in May 1945. Before I continue with my formal statement, I would like to switch to Russian and invite you to put on the headphones. Because I would like to read from the screen shot of the smartphone of a smartphone of, uh, of a killed Russian soldier. That's an actual screenshot from someone who is dead already. Леш, ты как? Почему так долго не отвечаешь? Why has it been so long since you responded? Вы точно на учениях? Are you really in during in training exercises? Спрашивает мать убитого солдата. Asks the mother of the killed soldier. Моменты перед тем, перед тем, как он был убит. Moments before he was killed. Мама, я уже не в Крыму. Мама, I'm no longer in Crimea. Не на учениях. I'm not in training sessions. А где? Where are you then? Папа спрашивает, можно ли тебе послать посылку? Папа спрашивает, можно ли тебе послать посылку? Да какую посылку, мама? What kind of a parcel, mama, can you send me? Что ты говоришь такое? What are you talking about? What happened? Мама, я на Украине. Мама, I'm in Ukraine. Тут настоящая война. There is a real war raging here. Мне страшно. I'm afraid. Мы бьем по всем городам. We are bombing all of the cities together, even, even targeting civilians. We were told that they would welcome us, and they are falling under our armored vehicles, throwing themselves under the wheels and not allowing us to pass. They call us fascists. Mama, this is so hard. In several moments he was killed. And this was several moments before he was killed. Imagine, if you want to just visualize the magnitude of the tragedy. You have to imagine next to you, next to every nameplate of every single country in this General Assembly, more than 30 souls of killed Russian soldiers already. Next to every name of the every single country in this assembly, 30 plus killed Russian soldiers. Hundreds of killed Ukrainians, dozens of killed children, and it goes on and on and on. So just imagine those killed people next to you when you will listen to my formal statement. Big militarized power seeking for geopolitical greatness has launched a full-fledged military offensive against a smaller neighbor aimed at invading the country. Deadly airstrikes dropped on civilians' heads across the entire country and the Russian troops crossed Ukraine's borders 
from the territory of Russia, Belarus, and the occupied parts of Ukraine's Donbas and Crimea. Does it remind you of something, doesn't it? Indeed, very clear parallels could be drawn with the beginning of the Second World War too. And the Russia's course of action is very similar to what their spiritual mentors from the Third Reich employed on the Ukrainian land 80 years ago. Just one, the most recent example. Example of human sufferings. Example of war crime. As all of us were on our way to the General Assembly today, the Russian army shelled with Grad multiple rocket launcher systems the residential areas of the city of Kharkiv, the second big biggest in Ukraine. Innocent civilians have been killed and wounded. The exact numbers is very difficult to estimate because of uh, the warfare, while the negotiations are still underway at the border with Belarus. We therefore express our gratitude for overwhelming support that made this decision on the emergency session possible. We are grateful to the President of the General Assembly for his taking care of this idea well in advance. We appreciate the engagements, engagement of the UN Secretary General, who has taken a very strong stance in support of peace, in support of the UN Charter. We have been prompted to call for an emergency special session as the level of the threat to the global security has been equated to, the, to that of the Second World War. Or even higher, following Putin's order to put an alert Russian nuclear forces. What a, what a madness. If he wants to kill himself, he doesn't need to use nuclear arsenal. He has to do what the, same, what, what the guy in, in Berlin did in a bunker in May 1945. The Security Council addressed the issue of the Russian war against Ukraine, and the decision was not adopted due to the obvious reason. The country attempting to occupy Ukraine since 2014 has occupied the seat of the, of the, of the Council permanent member since 1991. Therefore, we do not accept the Russian logic that the Security Council was unable to act due to one-sided and unbalanced approach. The only guilty party is the Russian Federation. Distinguished delegates, Russia uses all its military potential to attack Ukraine and has begun redeploying reserve units on the border with Ukraine. It fires cruise and ballistic missiles at cities, attacks with aviation, tanks and artillery, sends sub subversion and reconnaissance groups which mark residential buildings in preparation for the air attacks. Russia's missiles are now aimed at destroying the infrastructure objects. They targeted the radioactive waste disposal site near Kyiv, the fuel base in the town of Vasil Kyiv, that is effectively a Kyiv's suburb. The objects of logistic infrastructure, including bridges, airports, and water reservoirs, remain among the targets. Such towns as Chester and Stanitsa Luganska near Luganska are now nearly destroyed, as well as residential buildings in and around Kiev and Kharkiv. The Russian forces seized the Chernobyl nuclear power station at the part of southern Kherson region, including the North Crimean Canal. Due to the active moving of Russian heavy militaries through the Chernobyl exclusion zone, the radiation level has increased rapidly. In the Black Sea, Russian warships deliberately attacked two civil vessels under the flags of Panama and Moldova, approaching Ukraine. 
This constitutes a flagrant violation of the international law of the sea. Incredibly, some, one of the vessels had the Russian crew. Still, it was attacked by the Russians. Russians keep attacking kindergartens and orphanages, thus committing war crimes and violating the Rome Statute. Hospitals and mobile medical aid br brigades are also targeted by the Russian shelling and the sabotage groups working in Ukraine cities and towns. The Russian military fired on ambulance crews in the areas of Zaporizhia and Kiev. In Akhtyrka district of Sumy region, Russian tanks shot down a bus with civilians. Later, the Russian military does not allow, did not allow ambulances on the spot. As of today, 352 people, including 16 children, were killed on the Ukrainian side, and 2,040 Ukrainians, including 45 children, wounded during the first five days of the Russian invasion. And this number is growing nonstop. I have already told about the morning shellings in Kharkiv, and we cannot really estimate at this moment how many were killed. In response, Ukraine has activated its right for self-defense according to the Article 51 of the UN Charter. The Russian troops are suffering losses, aircrafts, helicopters, tanks, trucks, personnel. The aggressive forces have already lost more than 5,000 in manpower during the first days of aggression. Excellencies, the General Assembly should be vocal in demanding from the Russian Federation to stop its offensive against Ukraine. In recognizing Russian actions as an act of aggression against a sovereign and independent state, in demanding from Russia to immediately, completely, and unconditionally withdraw its forces from the territory of Ukraine with, within its internationally recognized borders, in demanding from the Russian Federation to reverse the decision related to the status of certain areas of Donetsk and Lugansk regions of Ukraine, in demanding full compliance with the provisions of international humanitarian law. The General Assembly should also be clear with regard to the treacherous role of Belarus and its involvement in aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine. Distinguished members of the General Assembly, what is happening now in Ukraine has already had the security and humanitarian implications for all of you. Immediately for Europe, a bit later for the rest, including in terms of food security, energy security, financial markets, collapse of the economies. Last September, my president said, while delivering his statement at the high level segment of the 76th session of the General Assembly, and I quote, I understand that criticism of the UN is often heard, but we criticize ourselves, end of quote. If we fail to respond now, we will face much more than criticism. We will face oblivion. It must not happen. Now it is time to act, time to help Ukraine that is paying now the ultimate price for freedom and security of itself and of the world. If Ukraine does not survive, intention, survive, international peace will not survive. If Ukraine does not survive, the United Nations will not survive, have no illusions. If Ukraine does not survive, we cannot be surprised if democracy fails next. Now we can save Ukraine, save the United Nations, save democracy, and defend the values we believe in, and that Ukrainians are fighting for and paying with their lives. The Russian delegate will speak shortly.
Putin has done everything to delegitimize the Russian presence in the United Nations. But I wonder if the Russian presence in the United Nations has ever been legitimate. I wonder if ever this whole, this assembly voted in accordance with paragraph two of article four on admission of the Russian Federation to the United Nations, either in December 1991 or in January 1992, or wherever thereafter. I want to ask the delegates whose countries voted for admission of the Russian delegation to the United Nations to raise their hand, to confirm that Russia was admitted to the United Nations according to the Charter. Please, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please raise your hand if your country voted in the formal session of the General Assembly in reply to the letter by President Yeltsin dated December 24, 1991, when he told the United Nations that Russia would like to be a continuator state of the demised Soviet Union. Anyone? Shall I put my glasses if my vision fails me and I don't see any hand raised? Any country? Anyone voted for Russian membership? I leave you with that and think about it when you listen to the Russian delegate. I thank the distinguished representative of Ukraine. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, distinguished colleagues, in recent days, the Ukrainian issue has made headlines, global headlines, and has now been given pride of place at the UN Security Council and now the General Assembly. At the same time, Russian actions are being distorted and thwarted. And there is uh, the number of incredible fakes is staggering with the use uh, with the media outlets and social networks proliferating uh, these lies. For this reason, today I wish to focus on the real reasons for the crisis that has emerged and its possible consequences. I wish to emphasize the following. The root for the current crisis lies in the actions of Ukraine itself. For many years, it sabotaged and flouted its direct obligations under the Minsk package of measures. Just recently, very recently, there was a hope that in Kiev uh, they would reconsider and that they would indeed comply with what they signed on to back in 2015. 
Для этого прежде that, всего был нужен прямой диалог с Донецком и Луганском. Однако, подтверждение Поскольку украинские провокации против Донбасса в феврале не только не Руководство ЛНР и ДНР обратилось к нам с просьбой оказать военную поддержку в соответствии с двусторонними договорами о сотрудничестве, что стало логичным шагом, является Украинская власть, которую в последнее время активно вооружали и подзуживали ряд государств, Пребывало в заблуждении о том, что с благословения западных кураторов они могут добиться военного решения проблемы Донбасса. Иначе сложно объяснить существующую политическую ситуацию стрелок Western sponsors unmoved in recent Такое years this is discussion at the City Council General Assembly. There was no empathy whatsoever, no compassion for the people of Donbass and Lugansk. It seems that these four million people simply don't exist for them. And as a result, the ongoing threats targeting the people of LPR and DPR, given the lack of prospects for addressing the problems in the area under the Minsk operations due to the failure to fulfill them, the Russian president took a decision for a special military Special military operations to be carried out in the Donbass occupation of Ukraine is not part of, this, of these plans. The goal of the special operation is to protect the people who for eight years were subject to torment and, genoc and genocide by the Kiev regime. To that end, there is a, we, there is a need to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. We Further, we'll strive to hold accountable those who carried out countless brutal crimes against the people, uh, the, the residents, uh, including uh, residents of the Russian Federation. This decision was taken in line with Article 51 of the United Nations Charter with the sanction of the Federation Council of the Russian Federation. In pursuit of the agreement on friendship and cooperation with DPR and LPR, I wish to recall further that the principle of sovereignty and territorial integrity of states uh, uh, is, is, is something which we are being accused of breaching vis-à-vis -vis Ukraine. The Declaration of Principles of International Law on Friendly Relations between Peoples was adopted in 1970, and it needs to be unceasingly complied with with respect to states, I quote, complying in conducting themselves in compliance with the principle of equal rights and self-determination of people as described above and thus possessed of a government representing the whole people belonging to the territory without distinction as to race, creed, or color. End of quote. Without discrimination, whether on the basis of race or status, a blanket denial is not the answer nor representative of the values we seek to protect. Mr. President, Sierra Leone voted in favor of the resolution based on our fundamental belief in the sanctity of the United Nations Charter, its, principle, its principles, and the purposes of the organization. Our vote today is not a selective application of our fundamental belief in the principles of sovereign equality of all UN member states, the territorial integrity or political independence of member states, non-interference, and the peaceful settlement of dispute. 
Our vote today is not to absolve the actions and inactions of the United Nations, particularly in addressing peace and security questions in Africa. While we believe that the United Nations must be consistent in the application of its charter and in pursuit of its purposes, resorting to the threat or use of force and the violation of the territorial integrity of any member state inconsistent with the Charter must be rejected. Sierra Leone accordingly calls for the full respect of the national sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. We also call for the immediate cessation of hostilities, and in this regard, we welcome the commencement of ceasefire talks and we urge for the continuation of the talks in a meaningful way. Finally, we also urge for good faith diplomatic efforts to resolve the conflict. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Sierra Leone, and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Thailand. Mr. President, Thailand has carefully considered the draft and voted in support of the resolution because of the overriding importance that Thailand attaches to the principles enshrined in the United Nations Charter and those of international law. In particular, respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the non-use of force against states. Our support of the resolution also underlines our deep concerns for the plight of affected civilians and the humanitarian consequences of the hostilities and violence in the area. In this regard, we call on all parties to fully comply with their obligations under international humanitarian law. We are also concerned with the potential longer-term consequences on the rules-based international order and renew our call towards peace and for all parties to enhance dialogue through various means to truly realize a peaceful settlement of the situation. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Thailand, and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Brazil. Mr. President, we recognize the exceptional circumstances we are all facing and we share the conviction that the General Assembly could not remain silent. The resolution adopted this morning conveys a message, and Brazil has added its voice to that of other members. The adoption of this resolution by the General Assembly shows the unwavering commitment of the international community to upholding the core principles upon which the UN is built. We are appreciative of the attention given in different paragraphs of the text to the critical need to monitor and alleviate the humanitarian situation on the ground. We also welcome the text for urging the parties to the conflict to fully respect international humanitarian law to guarantee the safety of civilians, as well as of humanitarian and medical personnel, and to facilitate unhindered access of humanitarian assistance to those in need. The resolution as adopted, however, does not go far enough in underscoring that the cessation of hostilities is only a first step to achieve peace. Sustainable peace needs additional steps. In this respect, it is regrettable that the supportive role of the United Nations, that the supportive role that the United Nations can and should play has been left by the wayside in the eagerness to point fingers. Yes, the resolution is a call for peace by the international community. But peace requires more than the silence of guns and the withdrawal of troops. The path to peace 
requires comprehensive work on the security concerns of the parties. The only precondition should be an immediate ceasefire. Mr. President, the resolution cannot be seen as permissive towards the indiscriminate application of sanction, sanctions and the deployment of arms. These initiatives are not conducive to the proper res resumption of a constructive diplomatic dialogue and risk further escalating tensions with unpredictable consequences to the region and beyond. We also have concerns about Preambular Paragraph 15. It is not constructive at this moment fraught with danger in this particular resolution to comment on military measures adopted by any specific nuclear power, be it the Russian Federation or the members of NATO. Once effective negotiations do get started, all the parties must show true flexibility and spirit of compromise. Lasting solutions can only be achieved at the negotiating table through committed dialogue. Brazil continues to urge all actors to de-escalate and to renew efforts in favor of a negotiated diplomatic agreement between Ukraine and Russia that contributes to the establishment of the security and the stability of the region. We stand ready to resolutely work in favor of peace in the discussions in this assembly, in the Security Council, and in other fora. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Brazil. I give the floor to the distinguished representative of the United Arab Emirates. Thank you, Mr. President. This emergency special session comes as the conflict in Ukraine has reached a dangerous inflection point. The international community is alarmed by developments on the ground, and this is the clear message of today's resounding vote. The humanitarian situation is worsening by the day. We have seen reports of rapidly growing civilian casualties and massive displacement, the extent of which Europe has not experienced in decades. The UAE is deeply concerned by these developments. Our collective responsibility must, however, be towards exhausting all efforts and using all diplomatic channels to prevent a further deterioration of the humanitarian situation. We remain firm in that belief more than ever before. Yesterday, the UAE pledged five million US dollars in response to the UN's humanitarian flash appeal. We know that in the days, weeks, and months ahead, more must be done. The credibility of this organization, born out of the ashes of World War II, rests on its universal representation and its effectiveness in applying the principles that we all uphold. However, as this conflict has revealed, the clear and full voice of the United Nations has only grown harder to summon because it is not equally applied. Despite deepening divisions, now is time to take a step back, identify diplomatic off-ramps, and engage constructively to end this conflict. It is also a time to summon our reserves of wisdom and experience to guide the way forward. Global solidarity means doing more than focusing on conflicts in some parts of the world while ignoring others. We need to shift our mindset from conflict management to conflict resolution. Our collective security depends on it. Let this crisis be the wake-up call. The future of this organization may rest on that. We all need to galvanize UN efforts to promote the dialogue work towards an end to the hostilities and address the humanitarian situation for those most desperately in need. The UAE recognizes the need to meet this moment with renewed diplomacy and leadership and put the needs of the people on the ground at the center of our efforts. The avenues for dialogue must, however, remain open more urgently than ever before, and we must pursue them together. Mr. President, Right now, we recognize that this resolution adopted here today is a necessary signal 
of where we, we need to be going. Resigning ourselves to a cycle of perpetual violence and sanctions that only adds to the suffering of civilians diminishes us all. We voted for this resolution and we join with member states in making this appeal to peace, a just peace that endures by recognizing the legitimate concerns of all parties and also abides by the UN's charters of principles and independence and sovereignty and territorial integrity. This resolution, however, as others have said, is not enough for a sustainable peace. Resolution of this conflict requires dialogue and effective diplomacy. This text represents the determination of member states to respond to the conflict today in Ukraine. That is the call that rings clearly from this meeting. We must now turn to finding ways to bring about its peaceful resolution with full respect for and commitment to real and engaged diplomacy. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the United Arab Emirates. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of India. Thank you, Mr. President. India has been deeply concerned over the rapidly deteriorating situation in Ukraine and the ensuing humanitarian crisis. An Indian national was tragically killed in Kharkiv yesterday due to the ongoing hostilities. We express our deepest condolences to his family and to that of each and every innocent civilian who has lost his or her life in this conflict. We demand safe and uninterrupted passage for all Indian nationals, including our students who are still stranded in Ukraine, particularly from Kharkiv and other cities in the conflict zones. Many member states share this concern. We have reiterated this demand to both the Russian Federation and Ukraine. This remains our foremost priority. Ensuring the well-being and safety of our citizen is the basic duty of every government. We have therefore instituted special flights to bring back Indians home from conflict zones. My government has deployed senior ministers as special envoys to countries neighboring Ukraine to facilitate evacuation. We thank all neighboring countries of Ukraine for opening their borders and extending all facilities to our embassies at this time. India has already dispatched humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. This includes medicines, medical equipment and other relief material. We are sending more such tranches in the coming days. India supports the international community's call for an immediate ceasefire. We also support safe humanitarian access to conflict zones. We remain firm, firm in our conviction that differences can only be resolved through dialogue and diplomacy. Prime Minister Modi has unequivocally conveyed this in his discussions with world leaders, including of the Russian Federation and Ukraine. He underscored the urgent imperative for humanitarian access and movement of stranded civilians. We therefore sincerely hope that the second round of talks between the Russian Federation and Ukraine will lead to a positive outcome. India urges that all member states demonstrate their commitment to the principles of the UN Charter, to international law, and respect of sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states. Keeping in view the totality of the evolving situation, India decided to abstain. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of India. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Bahrain.
Eritrea firmly believes that respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence, as enshrined in the United Nations Charter, are sacrosanct principles and should be. His position is against internationalizing, incessant rhetoric and imposition of unilateral sanctions, which regrettably further polarize international relations and escalate the situation with enormous implications for civilians. Instead, we have consistently opted for world regions to be given the needed space and solidarity to address political problems. The situation between Russia and Ukraine raises serious concern with political, economic, and security ramifications for Europe and the rest of the world. It requires immediate resolution by giving more chance to diplomacy. We hope that the ongoing talks between the two parts on the Belarusian border yields a quick and acceptable agreement to stop the war and pave a foundation for peace in the region. Eritrea opposes all forms of unilateral sanctions as illegal and counterproductive. Eritrea, the country that has been subjected to such measures by the West for two decades, including new sets of unilateral measures, understands that sanctions do not resolve problems of peace and security. On the contrary, they only hurt innocent people and undermine the road to peace. It will be remiss if I don't address disturbing reports that African citizens living in Ukraine are facing difficult to cross the borders. We call on all countries to facilitate safe passage to people fleeing for safety regardless of their racial identity. Let me conclude, Mr. President, by reiterating that, <clears throat> that Eritrea would like to see that the windows for diplomacy remain open. We are confident of the ability of the parties to resolve their differences and reach an outcome that meets the interests <clears throat> and concern of all. We hope that the international community constructively supports the parties in their search for sustainable peace. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Eritrea, and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Islamic Republic of Iran. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Mr. President, the Islamic Republic of Iran is following the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine with grave concern. We reiterate our principled position regarding the need for peaceful settlement of disputes in accordance with international law and underline the need for full respect by all parties for the well-established provisions of the United Nations Charter, international law, including international humanitarian law. We emphasize that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states must be fully respected and the safety and security of all civilians must be guaranteed. In order to find long-term and sustainable solutions to such crises, it is necessary to address the root causes. We note that the current complexities in the fragile region of Eastern Europe have been exacerbated by the provocative actions and decisions of the U.S. and NATO. The security concerns of Russia must be respected. Wars and destructions inflicted on civilian lives and infrastructures are not acceptable. Wherever they occur, the Islamic Republic of Iran calls for urgent cessation of hostilities and the escalation of tensions in the current conflict. In this regard, Iran underlines the essentiality of dialogue to address issues of concerns to all sides, leading to long-term results. The UN must always avoid double standards, particularly when it's considering issues related to the maintenance of international peace and security. It is unfortunate to note that the UN, in particular the Security Council, has at times neglected this principle which has undermined its credibility. A case in point is the Security Council, Council's handling of the conflict in Yemen. Mr. President, we believe that the text of the resolution before the General Assembly lacks impartiality and realistic mechanisms for resolving the crisis through peaceful means. Furthermore, not all member states of the UN were given the opportunity to engage in negotiations on the text of the resolution. It should be emphasized that the General Assembly is not in a position to determine 
the existence of an act of aggression because in addition to Article 39 of the Charter, GA Resolution 3314 of 14 December 1974 calls on the Security Council to determine the existence of an act of aggression. Moreover, convening the emergency a special session based on the General Assembly Resolution 377A shall not be considered as the end of the dialogue. My government continues to call for a comprehensive, peaceful, and sustained resolution to the current conflict, including an immediate ceasefire and a start of the dialogue, as well as provision of humanitarian assistance to the people in need. For the above mentioned reasons, my delegation abstained from voting on the resolution. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Egypt. Thank you, Mr. President. Egypt would like to, reit to reiterate the following points with regards to the draft resolution that has been adopted and for which we have voted positively out of our belief in the uh, principles and values of international law and uh, the goals of the UN Charter. First, finding a swift political settlement to end this crisis through dialogue and peaceful means and through an act of diplomacy should be our common goal and should remain the goal of the whole international community when dealing in the current crisis. And we should also allow room to achieve this main goal through our endeavors. Second, Egypt reiterates that we should not disregard the necessity of dealing with the root causes of the current crisis and dealing with them in order to defuse the crisis and achieve peace and stability. Three, Egypt rejects the exploitation of economic sanctions outside the multilateral international mechanisms because previous experiences have shown that such um, sanctions can have dire humanitarian consequences and lead to, uh, the, to escalating the sufferings of civilians. Four, all parties should live up to their responsibilities and guarantee the flow of humanitarian assistance to all those in need without any form of discrimination. And they should also uh, guarantee the free movement of the residents across the borders because we have had reports of discriminatory treatments in that regard. Five, Egypt warns of the economic and social consequences of the current crisis on the global economy. The global economy is still suffering the uh, consequences of the pandemic and uh, the disruption in the supply chains and the international uh, aviation is the best proof. Six. The effectiveness and credibility of the international multilateral mechanisms in facing the different crises and challenges depends on how we deal with all the international crises based on the same standards and criteria in line with the UN Charter and its objectives without consecrating the status quo and humanitarian uh, sufferings for decades. And thank you. Thank the distinguished representative of Egypt. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Algeria. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to deliver the explanation of vote of my country, Algeria. At a time when my country, Algeria, is closely following the development of the situation and the escalation in Ukraine. My delegation would like to emphasize once again that Algeria is committed to the principles and the objectives of the United Nations, which should remain the basis of international law and a cornerstone in international relations, especially the respect of uh, the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of the member states according to the international legitimacy and the right of people to self-determination. 
and in line with our positions calling for enhancing multilateralism and safeguarding it, and also in line with our commitment uh, to developing uh, amicable relationships among countries based on peaceful coexistence and the peaceful settlement of conflicts and the mutual respect of international commitments and security guarantees. My country, Algeria, can only join all the other efforts and diplomatic calls aiming at de-escalating the current situation and adopting dialogue in order to foster peaceful coexistence among nations to safeguard international peace and security. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Algeria, and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of the United Republic of Tanzania. Mr. President, the United Republic of Tanzania has decided to abstain this resolution as a matter of principle and in defense of the UN Charter. Fundamentally, this decision resulted from our inability to amend or make reservations to some provisions in the resolution. We are convinced that there was a need to adjust the draft resolution. The United Republic of Tanzania believes that diplomacy is the best way to end this conflict. To this end, we appeal to all parties to the dispute to uphold human rights and their obligations under international law and humanitarian law to de-escalate the conflict and give peace a chance. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the United Republic of Tanzania, and now I give the floor to the represent, distinguished representative of South Africa. Thank you, Mr. President. And we thank you for giving us the opportunity to take the floor to elaborate on South Africa's decision to abstain on today's resolution. Mr. President, let me reiterate our position expressed during the discussions of the emergency special session over the last few days. Firstly, by highlighting that South Africa remains deeply concerned by the escalation of conflict in Ukraine and the regional and international socioeconomic implications. We strongly urge all sides to uphold international law, including humanitarian law and human rights law, as well as the principles of the UN Charter, including sovereignty and territorial integrity. So, President, the conflict involves two members of the United Nations in an armed conflict, which this organization has at its foundation the responsibility to prevent. The United Nations, therefore, must take decisions and actions that will lead to a constructive outcome conducive to the creation of sustainable peace between the parties. The resolution that we have considered today does not create an, an environment conducive for diplomacy, dialogue, and mediation. While we agree with and support the efforts taken by member states to bring to the attention of the international community the situation in Ukraine, South Africa feels that greater attention should have been paid to bringing the sides closer to dialogue. For South Africa, the text in its current form could drive a deeper wedge between the parties rather than contributing to a resolution of conflict. The resolution should have welcomed the commencement of negotiations between the parties. Additionally, the role of the Security Council as well as the good offices of the UN Secretary General could have been given more prominence in the resolution. It is understood that one of the root causes of conflict is related to the security concerns of, party, of the parties. 
this should have been addressed in the resolution. Even though this emergency special session of the General Assembly is being held after the failure of the Security Council to address the matter, we believe that the Security Council should still be urged to play its role as mandated by the Charter to maintain international peace and security. South Africa believes that the UN, especially in the context of emergency special sessions, whose nature and significance speak to the gravity of the issues we bring before the international community, should be used as a platform to build bridges, address the divergence of views, provide recommendation and support for the parties to engage with a spirit of compromise while de-escalating tensions, committing to the cessation of hostilities, and building trust and confidence. Unfortunately, the text before us did not do that. South Africa will have also preferred an open and transparent process to negotiate the resolution today. This would have allowed all of us as equal members of the assembly to present our views and ideally reach a level of understanding before the text was tabled. As member states of the organization committed to global peace and development, we must continue to work together to promote peace. Gestures that merely create the impression of promoting peace without meaningful action will not assist. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of South Africa, and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Lebanon voted yes on this resolution because Lebanon, a founding member of the United Nations, believes in the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter, especially the prohibition of the threat or use of force in international relations, the principle of non-intervention, and the peaceful settlement of disputes. Mr. President, these are not merely slogans for Lebanon. We lived through invasions, occupation, intervention in Lebanon's internal affairs, and experienced devastation, loss, and, and pain that we are still enduring its consequences today. That's why our decision today was not taken lightly. We know that we know what happens in wars. But we also know that wars happen not only when people fail to prevent them, but most importantly, when the voices of war drown the cries for peace. Lebanon, a peace-loving nation, enjoys a good relationship and friendships with all parties to this conflict, with Russia and Ukraine. And in this spirit, we call on everybody to go back to the logic of peace. Mr. President, yesterday, a European colleague told me he has never lived through war. I was happy for him. I lived through at least two invasions, a civil war, multiple assassinations, and explosions. That's why, Mr. President, I don't want anybody to live in what we lived through. It's time for, dipl for diplomacy, for dialogue, and a peaceful resolution of this conflict. I hope that all my colleagues here in this GA hall will put the same energy and commitment that was put to make this vote and its result a reality to start working for a peaceful resolution that takes both sides' concerns and interests into consideration so the world will step away from this abyss of war. Mr. President, the preamble of the United Nations Charter tells us, quote, to unite our strength to maintain international peace and security. Now we need this unity, unity for peace, the United Nations is well positioned to step up and step in to make this peace a reality. Now we need to stop the escalation in words and deeds and help both sides to take the path of peace for the sake not only the two sides, but for the sake of our world. Mr. President, we in the Middle East are very concerned about this war because of its impact on Europe, but also because we know from experience what happens in Europe does not stay in Europe that the last two world wars left deep scars in our part of the world, obliterated countries and hopes, and we are still living its aftermath today. I hope, Mr. President, we all
all learn the lessons of the last wars, and I hope that from this moment, we start working only for peace, peace in our time, peace in all time, as a former president of the United States said. Mr. President, I agree with Albert Camus in his speech upon receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in literature in 1957, that probably, and as a quote, every generation sees itself as charged with remaking the world. Mine, however, knows that it will not remake the world, but its task is perhaps even greater, for it consists in keeping the world from destroying itself. This is the same responsibility bestowed on us as the Charter instructed us to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Lebanon, and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Malaysia. Mr. President, as a member of the family of nations, Malaysia is committed to the principles and purposes of the Charter of the United Nations and the ideals it espouses. We reiterate the inviolability of the fundamental principles of territorial integrity and sovereignty of a country and peaceful settlement of disputes in the maintenance of international, international peace and security as well as global prosperity. All parties must uphold these fundamental and sacrosanct principles of the, of the UN Charter and international law that guide the conduct friendly of friendly relations between nations and peaceful, peaceful coexistence. Many will agree that the resolution before us is far from perfect. While my delegation continues to have concerns with some of the language contained in the resolution, Malaysia voted in favor of it as a matter of principle and out of our strong conviction of the aforementioned principles. Mr. President, Malaysia values its strong and close relation with Ukraine and Russia. We believe the differences and legitimate security concerns of both parties, given the complex geopolitical context, must be addressed through dialogue and peaceful means in accordance with the principles of the UN Charter and rule of law. In this context, we welcome the direct talks between, held between Russia and Ukraine in Belarus and urge both sides to continue on the peaceful path to prevent further loss of life and destruction. From the vivid discussion at this emergency special session, what stood out glaringly to us as an overwhelming desire was an overwhelming desire for the current conflict to be peacefully resolved. The Assembly has spoken with a clear and fervent voice on the matter today. Now, more than ever, the Security Council has to live up to its primary responsibility as the, as the custodian of international peace and security. Malaysia calls on the Security Council to spare no effort in resolving this conflict. Mr. President, the future of humanity is at a precipice. Humanity must prevail, and peace is the only answer. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Malaysia. Now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Nepal. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, my delegation is distressed by the ongoing violence and conflict in Ukraine. Conflict anywhere inflicts stress everywhere. Nepal is a peace-loving country as its soil is consecrated by the birth of Lord Buddha, an apostle of peace. For us, values of peace, harmony, and peaceful coexistence are our way of life, so they are supremely precious. Norms of world peace, respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, and non-aggression as enshrined in the UN Charter are the fundamentals of our foreign policy. The use of force against Ukraine goes contrary to these values and principles. Nepal opposes this violation of international law and the principles of UN Charter. Mr. President, there is no alternative to diplomacy and dialogue to building peace and sustaining it, Nepal welcomes the second round of talk between Russia and Ukraine. We urge both sides to continue the dialogue 
with utmost sincerity and integrity to resolve this conflict peacefully and find a lasting political solution for their enduring peace and peace for the Europe. Based on Nepal's principled position on the inviolability of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of any state under international law, rules-based international order, and United Nations Charter, my delegation has voted yes on the draft resolution that was before us today. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Nepal, and now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Iraq. Thank you, Mr. President. We have requested the floor to justify our vote. Iraq abstained in this vote on Resolution A slash ES dash 11 slash L1. Iraq regrets the deterioration of the situation and the escalating tensions between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. And Iraq calls upon all parties to settle this conflict by giving priority to dialogue and through the diplomatic means. And we invite them to go back to negotiations in order to solve their concerns and in order to safeguard international peace and security and not to uh, threaten the world with economic and political crises resulting from this situation. Iraq expresses its grave concern over the possibility for the terrorists of exploiting this crisis and the expected division in the international community. This would hinder the international efforts and our joint endeavors aiming at preventing terrorism and violent extremism. Iraq has decided to abstain because of our historic, historical background in Iraq and because of our sufferings resulting from the continuing wars against our peoples. Iraq, and in principle, does not support wars as a settlement mechanism. And we reiterate that all conflicts should be settled peacefully in order to safeguard the lives of civilians. Iraq calls upon all parties to uphold the UN Charter and international law and emphasizes the necessity of safeguarding the security and safety of the international staff and the humanitarian workers. And thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Iraq. And now I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Jordan. Shukran, Sayyid al Thank you, Mr. President. Jordan has voted for the draft resolution that has been adopted in order to 